Please join us in welcoming technology entrepreneur and angel investor, Jason Calacanis, and founder and CEO of Altimeter, Brad Gerstner, in discussion with Skift founder and CEO, Rafit Ali. Back. Okay. Um, how are all of you? Still holding? Okay. Well, thank you. You are in for a treat because nobody's left in this room and we're just going to shoot the breeze. <coughs> we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. Do it. Um, the reason I was so excited for both of them, I emailed them, I don't know, four months ago yeah. together. And my email was it would be my dream for both of you to come to the Global Forum. Hmm. And literally within five minutes, he said yes, and he said, Jason, what are you going to do? You want to come or not come? And he said, Jason, of course I'm going to come. Yeah. The back history is that I've known Jason for 25 years now. I was his, his, his one of his employees. Yeah, uh, this I'm sorry. Yeah, very sorry about that. Uh -uh. In the Jason we had a one, good time. In the Jason 1.0 phase. Silicon Alley reporter. Silicon Alley reporter phase. You were how old, 23? 24, 25, yeah. And I was yeah. maybe two or three years older than you. I was probably 27 or 28. Yeah, and uh, this a story for another time, but Jason literally saved my life, which is a story that at some point I will tell yeah, the world. Maybe for your autobiography, autobiography 20, 30 years. I'm, yeah. I'm sitting here alive because of him. <laughs> so it's, it's actually a true story. Yeah. Uh, but Jason um, is also an investor in Skift, which has nothing to do with why he's here, but he just happens to be a huge supporter of Skift as well. Um, it's amazing to see what you've built, by the way. I mean, I read it, and it's just amazing. Appreciate that, it. Yeah. And um, also, he's, at this point, probably one of the most famous podcasters in the world. How many of you know the All In Podcast? <laughs> Holy cow. Wow. Uh, that's uh, like And yeah, um, So most of the people here are in the room for Brad Gerstner, and there's a groupies that really want to meet Jason. <laughs> Well, but we're also that, that makes sense. We're besties. Uh, and we do a lot of business together, yes, travel yes. together. So we have a lot of adventures that we can. And talk about. literally, I got so many emails. Can you please introduce me to Jason? And so there's going to be a line of people after that I really want to meet you. Sounds great. Serious. Hopefully, uh, some founders of companies. Let's get to talking. So yeah. and and Enough Brad. Jason. And let me just also set up for Brad. So uh, in 2011, I think maybe at the first Focus Right conference or something, uh, Brad is the star. And like everybody's trying to go to him. And like I couldn't reach him because we hadn't started Skift and nobody gave a shit. And, um, and we started Skift in 2012. And I'm going to say like three, four, five years later, I, Brad, I ran into him or maybe he came to our conference or something happened. And he said something to the effect that, Rafa, you built a great thing. And so I immediately called Jason, my co-founder, and Dennis and said, I think we've arrived because Brad said that we've done <laughs> something good. So uh, anyway, this is a context as a fanboy to start, start the Q&A. Um, you both of you have a very spectral view of the world. For, as I'm sure all of you who watch, uh, who listen, and I watch on YouTube, yep. um, the All In podcast, they talk about all kinds of topics. Brad, from your perspective, um, from a macro perspective, where we're sitting. Everybody's trying to figure out, is the boom phase for travel over while the world obviously has slowed down? It seems like every CEO says, we're, we're building capacity, uh, we're starting new routes, we're starting new hotels. That continues to happen. From your macro perspective, you're an Altimeter Capital, yeah. which invests in a lot of these companies. Give us a sense. Um, what I would say is the human desire to travel, I'm just going to show you. Like, look at this slide, All right? That's this morning, planes in the air, arriving and departing from New York. The human desire to move, to have experiences, is only increasing, right? What stands in the way of that is, of course, human productivity, what we have to do to survive, and our capacity to access it. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, if I go back to 1999 when I got involved in online travel, Rich Barton said to me, we're going to take the green screen, we're going to turn it around, and we're going to give power to the people, right? We're going to let them for the first time see the pr 
flights and the times and the prices and and it just removed friction to the experience and you know but yet so the secular trend around travel uh, is as steep as ever but the cyclical trend around what we've all gone through we just survived a global pandemic um, those cycles don't go away and you know so the cycle that we're in right now the Fed has radically increased interest rates 8% mortgages, 10% credit cards, or 20% credit cards, 10% car loans, student loan debt now has to be repaid, consumers have burned through their stimulus uh, savings, we talk about a lot, and so if you look at, you know, our own travel demand, uh, you know, forecast, travel demand has come back, but now it's flattening out and it's starting to turn down a bit again. Um, so we'll see where this goes, but you know, the revenge travel coming out of COVID, like we, it, it, what it proved to us is humans hate lockdowns. Like we want to be here. We want to come to New York. I mean, Uber's on fire in New York. All these businesses are doing incredibly well, but make no mistake about it. Consumers are under economic pressure. Um, that was the intention of the Fed and they are. And so in terms of how and, and you've obviously uh, have been on boards and, and, and understand the OTA world very well. Um, how should OTAs think about the next coming phase of travel? You and I talked well, a little uh, bit Well, you know, let, let's, uh, I'm ping pong this back, you know, to, to well, Jay. Well, you, you answered that question. I'm well, I mean, like, listen, I, I, and I'll tee this up maybe in a way that you, yeah. you and I can riff on this because we, we basically live parallel lives in internet 1.0, 2.0, and we're thinking a lot about where the world's going now. But, you know, Larry Page once said to me, you know, about Google that he's like, this isn't where we want to be. This is just where we are. He's like, effectively, what we created was the world's largest card catalog, right? 10 Blue Links is like pulling out an endless drawer of documents that allow us then to go get one step closer to whatever we're trying to do. But what are we really trying to do? We're trying to figure out the perfect hotel room, the perfect flight, the perfect car, the perfect sunset view, the perfect restaurant. And Google's pretty unfulfilling in that regard, but it was a hell of a lot better than the world before we had access to anything. And so it felt automagical. But here we are 20 years later, and we still experience the world in roughly the same way. And as much as I love all the OTAs, they're effectively search engines in the underbelly of Google. So you have a search engine that's a, a card catalog that leads you to another card catalog and a page filled with advertising that's really tough. And, you know, like I really look forward to the experience when I just say to my general purpose AI who already knows everything about me, knows where I like to stay in New York, knows the restaurant, knows the view, knows the table, knows. I just say, hey, next Thursday, book me the standard. And it happens. And it's automatic. It's not there yet, though, today, but it will. What do you think, Jason? So you play, so Jason, uh, the history of Jason also is you're early in everything. You're early well, in newsletters. You. Yeah, email newsletters, we did it in the You 96. were early in zines in the 90s. Yeah, zines. Uh, you were early in weblogs, in blogs. Blogs, yep. You were early in podcasting as well. Yeah, one of the first. You yeah. were early in Uber as well. Third investor, yeah. Um, it's a very simple technique. <laughs> um, well, no, you so mentioned I five things that I got too early but you didn't mention in between each of those are 10 things I tried that didn't work. So what happens is, but you're and this still is- still early even in the things that didn't work. Yeah, so-, so my question but, is, yeah. should, what's the value of being early in AI world? Yeah, um, if you're early, and early in our industry as, a, as technologists is somewhere between like six and 12 months. I think people really overestimate what early is and then they underestimate what can be accomplished in decades, right? Mm. So AI right now, how many people used ChatGPT today? Raise your hand if you use ChatGPT today. Okay, that's phenomenal. It's like a third or a half of the audience, pretty amazing. Um, we're in essentially year zero, the first year of consumers really using AI, not a developer writing AI, that's existed for decades, but consumers using it. and. Yeah, it's kludgy and it doesn't work exactly, but it's going to be the most disruptive trend of our lifetimes. Um, it will be more disruptive than the internet. It will be more disruptive um, than mobile, certainly cloud. Uh, and it will be even more disruptive of the PC revolution. If you put all of those together, those were like the prequels to what's happening right now, the main event. And the main event is going to be 
um, massive job destruction, massive efficiency, um, and then solving the world's most complex problems. And it, it does sound crazy when I say it, but it is, I'm seeing it happen right now. Uh, the companies we invest in are... And you invest in like 150 companies a year. Yeah, so I have an investment firm launch. We have 19 full-time people. We have 20,000 people apply for funding a year. We meet with 3,000 of them. And then we invest in 150 of them. And uh, you know we deploy tens of millions of dollars a year doing this. And every 50 investments or so historically, uh, maybe at every 40 to 60, somewhere in there, um, I'll hit a unicorn. right? And it pays for all the mistakes. Uh, and so it's a really fun job um, if you have the stomach for it. Um, but what's happening right now that I see across all the companies is entire job categories are being made 30% more efficient, 20% more efficient, 50% more efficient in year one. And I think in year two, it speeds up. And so what's getting hit right now? Um, event planners, um, I think travel agents, which were hit before, but some of that planning kind of stuff or planning an event like this. Um, research, um, what's called an SDR, a sales development rep. Uh, a lot of repeatable stuff, and there's a really interesting uh, way to predict what will happen, right? Because you said I'm early to stuff. It's, I hang out with a lot of smart people and I take notes. And Sarah Tavel from Benchmark, um, she had written a blog post of how she was looking at business process outsourcing in India, what jobs were being sent to India uh, to be done there to get the arbitrage of labor. And so anything that's being business process outsourced will be done by AI. And in fact, the business process outsourcing companies are using AI and then pretending mm. that you know, somebody exactly. spent 50 hours this week on it when somebody really spent five, yeah. and they just charge you for 50. So we will see entire categories of work go away, um, whether it's people driving cars. Um, just like we saw, you know, whenever labor um, has its moment and fights for more, they have to be very careful to not fight for too much, um, because then what I've seen is the uh, a lot of organizations will, will start adapting technology faster. So the perfect example that was here in New York, anybody remember about 15 years ago, um, fast food workers went on strike in New York. Yes. Um, they were upset and now you go to McDonald's and do you order from a cashier or do you order from a from kiosk? kiosk or, yeah. Exactly, and so that technology I was investing in at that time and voila, that job went away. Now you have a bunch of auto work, and, and I'm very pro-labor and people should fight for their best salary, but this time will be different. This change is more profound and it's happening at 100 times the speed. So take that one example of cashiers, boom, and then the person making the french fries, person making the burger, the accountant for that McDonald's, all of that is just gonna get abstracted away and done by AI. And we'll have one person doing the work of 10, just like we saw in agriculture. And so, so travel industry, and you know this very well, uh, is one of the world's largest employers of people. Like people move into middle class as a result of travel. The frontline workers in travel are probably the largest creators of middle class. That's how they move into it. As you're thinking about uh, investing and as well as looking over the world from a tech perspective, how do you reconcile? Like where would the jobs come from and how do we retrain here in US? Well, I mean, there are a couple really big embedded questions there. Is this good or bad for the travel companies? Is this good or bad for the online travel companies? And then what does this mean for the social contract in America? And I think those are all gonna be the profound questions, uh, the last one in particular, that we're gonna struggle with for the next decade. I totally agree with Jason. This will be the largest, single largest labor displacement in the history of capitalism. What we saw happen to blue collar, in places like Tesla, you walk into a Tesla factory and there aren't a lot of humans in it. Um, uh, you know, I would, And he's working on Optimus. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the Optimus Tesla robot. Like. And so, you know, there's, and, and to Jason's point, engineers are now 20, 30, 40% more productive. Meta kegered their engineering headcount by 40% for the five years up to 2022. And now Mark Zuckerberg is saying they're going to cager it at one to two percent, right? That's the implication, you know. Of, so explain of, that for people who won't understand. Uh, I mean, it, it just means you're going to you, the company's still growing really fast, but you're going to hire a lot less engineers. They're expensive. They want a lot of stock-based compensation and other things. 
but because each engineer is now 1x, 2x, 10x better as a result of co-pilots like GitHub, et cetera, um, you just, you don't need as many to accomplish the same task. But the thing that's most interesting for me in this room is, you know, to think about, um, you know, how that flows through all of these things. And the, the place I focus most on is in online travel. And as a consumer, what I've always wanted is that auto magical experience that I explained earlier. And I think there is an open question right now. Does the unique data and talent and skills of Booking.com and Expedia and Kayak, um, of TripAdvisor, et cetera, does that entitle them to an advantage mm -hmm. in this new thing? Or, as Clayton Christensen and others would talk about the classic innovator's dilemma, does your economic business model and the talents and treasure you have inhibit your ability to reinvent yourself? So I would argue, and I did, I have on the pod, I think that Google, Google right now is a monopoly with monopoly profits, okay? So whatever the thing is in the future that the world's going to become, I would argue it's unlikely that it will be as good for them as it is today, okay? It's very difficult for monopolies to survive disruption. See AT&T. And so when we get to the other side, I think even if Google executes incredibly well Right? There's going to be more competition. Half the room raised their hand on chat GPT. A year ago, if he had asked that question, 100% of you would have used Google for that exact same task. Yeah. So to me, what, my criticism of Sundar was he lost the verb. He didn't say, how many of you have used Bard? He didn't say, how many of you have used Cohere or Anthropic or Claude? He said, how many of you have used... ChatGPT, that is the verb today for AI, and that's extraordinarily valuable. So I think this new thing is sufficiently disruptive. I thought that mobile was going to disrupt search. It kind of did, but didn't really. Yeah, I mean, what mobile did was it increased the amount of time we all spend online, because all those periods of time right. between when we were at computers right. became available. Um, and so there is going to be a really amazing opportunity in travel, which is there are other trends that have occurred uh, while AI is happening. So while this massive efficiency happens, that means, because uh, technology is deflationary, people's costs will go down. And then you have generations change where Gen Xers, you know, we wanted to be successful, we kind of bought into, you know, trying to be in charge and working hard, and then millennials got a little softer, and then you have these Gen Zs who are like, you know what, it's all bullshit, I want to retire early, I want to have experiences. And what is the UAE, like the, the auto workers, what are they fighting for? A four-day work week. That's the fight. What is the fight today for American workers? I don't want to go to an office. Like, this is like the, this is where we are, people. <laughs> We're fighting to work less and to not commute and to live more. Who benefits from that? Y'all benefit from that. People are going to be taking longer vacations. Americans are going to start looking like Europeans. The concept of an American working in August will go away. We will all be taking August off. Uh, congratulations. You can let your boss know when you get back to work tomorrow uh, that you get August off. But that's what's happening. And I see it with young people. Any young person you were to offer this deal to, here's your salary. It's going to be $100,000. Or you can make 60 or 80 for working three or four days a week. Guaranteed nobody takes five days a week. Guaranteed mm. for anybody under 30. They all would want more freedom, more flexibility. This is why Uber has six million drivers compared to the one or two million people who work at McDonald's or Starbucks. Having watched that movie, the press, which is filled with a lot of dishonest people, I don't want to sound like Trump here, but they have a massive agenda. Um, and they really hate technology because of what we did to their business. It, we destroyed it. Uh, you know, Google, Facebook took all the ads. Craigslist took all the uh, listings. They're kind of bitter about it. And if you, if you just look at, at you know, how the world is changing generationally, it, it's going to be extraordinary how much free time, more free time people have. And it's, Amer I, I've watched the trend as a New Yorker living in California. Like everything starts in California, then it goes to New York, makes its way to London, and eventually. You have changed, Jason. You're saying it starts in California? <laughs> well, I mean, like nut milks, yoga, four day work weeks, working at home. This is all like crazy loony shit that started in California that <laughs> when I lived here in the 90s, if you asked for nut milk, they would be like, are you fucking crazy? Or if you took your clothes off and started smoking fentanyl in the street, they, people would be calling 911, you'd get tackled, you know. 
And then I live in the Bay Area. You go to San Francisco, people are drinking. The, the default at Blue Bottle is a nut milk. Like, if you ask for a latte, they give you oat milk, not milk. Not milk. Like, <laughs> has that happened in here yet? I no. Don't See, that's God. where you got to draw the line. Yeah. Um, and so I do think there's this massive generational change, and so people want to experience. are you optimistic about the young people, or are you? Oh, I'm super optimistic about um, the world right now, because I think as scary as the word disruption is, humans have always found something else to do. The fact that we now have a population of people who make a living TikToking, Instagramming, you just interviewed Mr. Podcasting. Beast at your, at your conference. Mr. Beast, yeah. I mean, there's more, to back to the Uber example, what people missed about Uber was it gave people control of their destiny. The idea of going to a 10-hour shift or working three, three-hour shifts when you wanted to, if you made half the amount of money, that was twice as valuable to, the, to a person who wanted to drop their daughter off at school, pick them up, have lunch with them, you know, and take them to soccer practice. And so that's the trend in the world. Um, and I think it's going to be more free time, and it's going to be amazing for travel. People, also the nomad thing is very real. There's an, you know, you, I watch a lot of subreddits. You love the filibuster. You, yeah. you need to get down on the question. Yeah. So we got but anyway, <laughs> subreddits are a great place to look for this. There's two subreddits that are really great. One of them is retiring early. There's an entire movement of people who want to make a shit ton of money and then retire by 40. Then there's another group that are overworked, overemployed, and what they do is they're developers and et cetera. And doing multiple jobs at the same time? Yeah, they, don't, they, they say they quit Google and then they go work at Twitter or wherever, and, but they don't actually quit. And, and they, Google they trade the strategies of how to set their schedule up and have two laptops and be on two Zoom calls at the same time. Oh, my internet went out, sorry, and then they answer the other one. Wow. Um, where are you going to go now? Uh, so so here's, here's what I'm going to go. I'm, uh, I'm about ready to tag him as, as the world's greatest moderator if you don't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's already trademarked it, so uh, second, second. I'm, I'm, I'm fine being the second to him. Um, you talk a lot about social inequality. So one, you, yeah. you, t you, both of you, I think, talked to Ray Dalio uh, 10 days ago, maybe, mm. was it? On, and he opened the talk at your All In Summit saying that the fall of civilizations happens when wealth inequality becomes the highest. You have a point of view on it. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Jason just described a world that's a little bit post-work. You know, if you read Aldous Huxley and Brave New World, that was the world they described. A world where labor and capital would become so productive that the, our productive use would no longer be required. And it would start, you know, 80 hour weeks to survive and then those would become 60 and then 40 and then 30. And I do think we're rapidly approaching a future where the social contract is gonna have to get renegotiated because the consequence of the Industrial Revolution um, particularly post-World War II and the consequence of the information age has been massive wealth concentration that Ray Dalio correctly points out. He does this extraordinary, I encourage you to go on YouTube or watch the All In Summit pod with him. Um, you know, like the fall of almost every civilization started with massive wealth inequality and led to internal revolution in the country. And we have that occurring in spades in the United States right now. Um, lots of discussions about what to do about it. People have talked about universal basic income, which I think is a terrible idea um, because I think it deprives people of a principal source of purpose, which is work. Um, but an idea that we've, we've talked about a bunch on the pod, Invest America, um, hopefully we'll have bipartisan legislation introduced this fall to create a private investment account for every child born in America, seeded with $1,000 from the federal government. Think of this as a 401k from birth. Um, so now we have 3.7 million children born every year in America. It's less than one-tenth of one percent of the federal budget to create this universal infrastructure of ownership. Compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. Um, and, you know, a child born 30 years ago who had $5,000 in their first two years of birth would be worth $287,000 today. It's hard to hate America. It's hard to feel like you're left out of the system. Right, 70% of people in this country don't own anything, don't have investment accounts, don't have savings accounts. I would argue like Ray Dalio and I think all of us on stage, that's untenable and it's about ready, we just told you all the people are gonna get displaced, about ready to get a lot worse. 
So I think as a country, we need to get ahead of it. One of the things that I'm excited about um, that comes out of this podcast is we not only talk about all of these things, but what are the actions you know, that we're taking? They've been interviewing the presidential candidates, which I think is a great service, the actions that we're going to take in order to you know, kind of bend the curve on this, but that's one we're working on. There are going to be lots of, lots of others that are needed. Um, let me talk a little bit about the podcast. So uh, for people who are obviously fans of the podcast, they want to know this question. What clicked? Like, why, why did it catch fire? What do you think it is? You're a, uh, you're a, so, con, you're a content creator for three days, yeah, like me. I, what so do you think it is? I just happen to know both of you, and I happen to know Chamath a little bit. Um, and it's the chemistry between all four of you. Okay. Super successful uh, people who can talk about the world intelligently in sort of a broad sweep of things, and your moderation. Okay. And so uh, I think that's what it started at a time during COVID where people uh, obviously, you know, this, this happened in all types of uh, uh, places. Are you? Um, well, I'm taking somebody, somebody just put I thought he was Brad checking Twitter. <laughs> so I want to make sure I got a photo of that. Keep going. <laughs> so, keep going. Um, so. No, I think you, you know. Well, and and you, uh, I know you, your, your views on current media. But, and you won't say this, but I will say this. Yeah that you are still at heart a journalist, even though you Yeah, I mean, to... I do random acts of journalism now. When you and I came up, we were taught, journalism is you collect the facts, you check the facts, you present the facts, and then you all make your own decision. And then, you know, over time, Fox News and Rupert Murdoch had this really great idea, hey, split the audience, pick a side, and you'll, you know, they'll give you more money. And, you know, and that really worked. And then the, the left-ish side and the moderate side were like, yeah, that's terrible. And then Trump got elected and people were like, well, that's an existential crisis. I can't handle this. Um, we have to pick the other side. And so then, you know, the New York Times just said like, you know, subscribe to the New York Times and the Washington Post so that we can investigate Trump. Like literally that was their advertising. And that's when you kind of knew it was over. I, I think Trump is a horrible human being. I think he's a criminal. I think he's an existential threat. I, I think yeah, he's like a horrible human pod, being. Yeah. But I still think the journalists should have you know, played it down the middle and, and not been advocates for one side or the other. Activist, and it's advocacy journalism right. today, right? And that's, I think, something's broken. But when things break, this is one of the great things about living in a free capitalistic society is that you get a chance to rebuild them. And I think uh, how many people here have listened to a podcast in the last 30 days? Raise your hand nice and high. If you listen to any podcast, it's everybody, right? How many people think that Fox and MSNBC have picked a side? Okay, so we're all in agreement here. <laughs> like, how many people want journalists to pick a side. Raise your hand if you want journalists to pick a side. I tricked you, huh? Simon says, touch your head, uh, touch your ears. <laughs> Simon didn't say, you're out. Security. Um, so nobody here wants that. But let's be honest about journalists. You and I grew up with them. Yeah. These are elitist, intelligent people, and they at some point decided that it was their job to save society or whatever, and there's a huge incentive. Now they've learned the worst lesson which is the Rupert Murdoch lesson. When you pick a side, you make more money. And the New York Times has learned it, oh, subscriptions. So it's like the best business model. And Washington Post learned it, and it's, it's a, journalism's a disaster. But what that means is now that, you know, we're 30 years into the open internet, and it's really easy to create, and all those tools were made over the last 20 years in broadband, and now you have a phone that is a, basically a CNN studio in your pocket. You have a studio in your pocket. Right. It's crazy. We could just do a podcast from out here and the whole world can watch it. It's nuts when you, when you think about that just 20 years after we were trying to make broadband work, 25 years maybe. Um, what that means is the people who were in the stories, the subjects of the stories, are now going direct to their customers or direct to the audience. And what you correctly point out about, I think, the All In podcast is it's for people who are in the arena, so to speak, Yes. Um, thank you for the answer. How many of you get that reference? <laughs> Some people got it. Um, it's for people who are capital allocators and company builders. And we're all 50 years old-ish, uh, so you got whatever that is, 30 times whatever, and then Brad's the fifth best, so you had him. You know, over 100 years of people actually building businesses. And there's a very interesting thing happens when you become, call it what it is, post-money. You, you're not motivated by money, let's say. Uh, or not, that's not your primary motivation, and you're not worried about running out of it. 
is there's like, if you draw an X, Y axis, there's a certain tipping point where you just don't give a fuck. Like, you can't cancel yeah. me. I've already made the money. If you, I was telling my daughter, because we like to talk about woke stuff, and I was like. You have, you have three daughters. I have three daughters, but the 13 year old is amazing. Just keeps talking about me getting canceled. And I'm like, I'm gonna get canceled today so that I can ski with you more. And she goes, okay, go ahead and do it. And I said, okay, trans people aren't good. And I start typing on my phone and she's like, don't do it, dad. And I'm like, they're great. <laughs> and then we just play this game of like how to get canceled and stuff like that. <laughs> so when they tried to cancel Chamath for saying like, listen, I don't care about the Uyghurs. I care about my kids. They're children of color. I care about what's happening in America. I care about my kids getting pulled over by a cop and getting shot or that is what's important to me, not what's happening around the world. You think you, I think you should focus here. They tried to cancel them. The White House wrote a note about it. The, Warriors, who we owned a piece of, wrote a note about it. Hey, we don't agree with Chamath, kind of thing. Um, and then this whole, can this very lame cancel culture and the Overton window being shut, and nobody can discuss everything. Like, even when I brought up trans people for a second, everyone's like, oh shit. <laughs> like, well, why can't we talk about that? Like, we, we can talk about any subject. And so that's, I think, what we're getting back to is we can talk about any subject, we can solve any problem, you don't need to be scared. People are generally good, is what I've learned in my years on the planet. People generally have good intentions, and uh, a good debate um, is good And you good guys for have a lot of ideological differences among all of you. Of course. And then what I hear in the podcast all the time is you're gonna go then play poker after. Yeah, you, it's crazy, but you could be friends with people that are different than you. <laughs> How does that work? I don't know, I mean, I grew up, and it was I'm just kidding. people were different than each other, and people, I remember when I was a kid watching like, okay, this person likes Bill Clinton, this person likes George Bush, this person likes Reagan, this person likes whoever was running against I mean, Reagan. I mean, Cal said this before. Um, so our Thursdays, we have dinner at six. We show up, we, have, we play a little poker, have dinner, uh, have a lot of discussion, a lot of vulnerability, uh, a lot of, you know, and we have a continuous argument throughout the week on, on text, you know, in our, in, our, in our group chat, and then we play poker after. And, and Jason said, our love language is arguing. Mm. You know, it, it really is a brotherhood. We trust one another. We bring our best to the table. Like our analysis, our arguments, we really are committed to excellence because we're all deeply passionate analysts and anthropologists about the world. Like that really is kind of the glue that puts it together. But then when we get around the poker table, like we want to mentally abuse everybody around the table and poker. take all of their money. And that is just the competition among friends. Who wins most of the time? It's mm, a good question. Phil Helmuth, world's greatest poker player. Yeah, he's the most consistently winning player in the game. For some reason, we play with the world's greatest poker player and we're all amateurs, so, <laughs> but we're good amateurs. Uh, it it kind of swings around. Nobody really wins or loses too much. It's kind of a friendly game in that way. Okay. And if you were there trying to win all the time, um, like you might do in a casino where you, if you're up 10K, you would just leave immediately. If you were to do that, you just wouldn't be invited back, so. Um, it says but, zero, but I think we should go so, another 10 uh, or so 15. My, my question to, to Brian is, uh, I know we're over time. Can we add some more time? Yeah, I, I give you permission. Okay, okay. Let's go. Uh, no, the, the uh, you know, There's the way, a lot of filibustering. We got shit to cover. Let's the go. Unit rule. So let's go to the Q&A. Uh, this actually is more a question for, for Brad. AI seems to take out an intermediaries. Will, the, will AI usher a new wave of book direct with the brand? If so, how do brands prepare oh, for this windfall? This was, I got a slide for this. Good. Uh, oh, this I, was a setup? I know, I, but, but, but I do if I can get them back. But if I can't, that's okay. No, no, well. they will. They will. Is um, there a but, way to but, bring so, the slide back? You know, ultimately, I think we, when you think about all the plumbing, all the APIs, whether it's MetaSearch or whether it was OTAs or whatever, ultimately, you know, it's, what we're trying to do is just solve the consumer impulse to get me this incredible thing that I'm looking for as easy as possible, right? We want convenience, we want price, we want it to anticipate and solve our problem for us. Um, I think it's really interesting on the left here is WhatsApp is a dominant platform payments and communication in India. Yes. So this is uh, you know, a product that they launched last week, which is in India, a lot of merchant transactions just occur organically on WhatsApp. 
right? You, you, you buy your food, you buy, and it's just people chatting and they use the payment platform or they'll go off platform to do payments, but you have a billion people who are doing this in India. Well, now they have inline direct bookings on Air India as an example. So just go ahead and choose it. And if you look at this, I would say, oh God, that kind of still feels web 1.0, 2.0, just on a, on a phone. But why would Zuckerberg be doing this? Well, today they launched or announced Right, they're ChatGPT, they're the meta agent that's going to live within WhatsApp. So oh, they announced gonna, it today? Yeah, okay. you're not gonna type anything in here. You're just gonna say to your meta AI, book me the Air India flight next Tuesday at 9 a.m. and it's going to do it. It has all your payment information, has a direct API to Air India, has everything it needs to know. And so we've been talking about this for 20 years. When mobile came, desktop search volumes went negative in 2012. We're like, oh my God, this is the end of Google. But it wasn't the end of Google. Why? Because they just pushed down all the organic advertisement, filled the page with a bunch of junk advertising, and we had nowhere else to go. There was no chat GPT. Now there is. Now they're all are alternative. I, I, I think Google's going to actually do great. Um, I think they're going to execute well. We have a little bit of a difference about this. No, big And deal. the reason I think that's going to happen is they just integrated Google Flights, Gmail, your yeah. docs, into uh, the Google search. So I don't know if anybody here turned it on last week. Did anybody turn that on, like the Google Flights in your search? Okay, like one person, and you're all in the travel industry? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Really? One of you turned it on? I played with it more Skift, than the traveling. Skift did a story, so, uh, so we... Ah, guys, you've got to read Skift and get on it. Um, anyway, it's a little complicated. I actually told Sundar this week. I was talking to Sundar, and I told him, it's too hard to turn it on. You have to go to your Gmail account. You can't use your Google Docs. Mm -hmm. Anyway, long story short, it doesn't work perfectly, but you'll be able to say things like, I want to leave from the East Coast and go to Dubai. What's my best city to leave from if I want a business class ticket? Because we've all played that game. Like, well, if I went to DC and left from DC, do I save two grand? I could see my mom when I'm there or whatever. You know, you, and you, you'll be able to ask very interesting questions. Hey, I want to go surfing. Or I want to go snowboarding. I want to do it in deep powder. What are my choices? And can I get a business class ticket there? And you know, I want to do this for under ten thousand dollars. What you would describe to a, a flight attend, a flight, uh, what do they call it? Travel, Travel agent. agent. Yeah. Those people, remember Travel those people? Agent. They exist, they exist, they exist. Those people, they would come to you with an envelope with a bunch yes, of yes, printed cards, behave, those yes, people. Behave. That's coming back, that's what the interface is gonna be, and it's gonna work. Right now, it doesn't work, it's kludgy, it breaks, it hallucinates, yada, yada. 12 months from now, I guarantee you, you will be able to say, book me three Michelin star restaurants when I'm in Hong Kong, and uh, book me a flight, business class, uh, I want a sleeper seat with the best Wi-Fi, and I want to go for a week. And uh, give me, you know, I don't care what days I leave, so figure that out. In one year, that will be done for you. Do you think that that, that entire agenda will be done for you? Off three sites: Open Table, Google Flights, and whatever. Do you think and, and voice becomes the interface, or, or chat becomes? Chat, or, or chat, chat's going to be. Does it matter? Chat's gonna, does it I matter? Mean, if you're on the subway, I suggest chatting because you'll look crazy. But if you're at home, the whole, you know, okay, Siri thing uh, and, and is hey, Alexa real. is actually going to work next year. No, no, no uh, and this is, but that is, in my, in my mind, whether it's voice or typing it. Doesn't like, matter. The interface is a dialogue. This is not one interaction, right? The first interaction is book me this next week. Then your, your agent, your fiduciary, your friend, your personal... Use, your, use a great personal assistant as a metaphor. If everybody had the world's best personal assistant... Yeah. Right? You don't run a search with your personal assistant. You have an interaction. Yeah. Right? And it becomes more efficient over time. But every single thing requires some refinement. That's why the metaphor, that's why the interface has to fundamentally, whether it's voice or you're typing it, it has to be a chat type interface. That's why Zuckerberg understands that with WhatsApp, you have 2 billion daily active users who are already chatting. You know what the <clears throat> Lex Friedman, the great podcaster, and I, we were having an argument one Saturday morning about this very topic on WhatsApp, <clears throat> okay? And we, we went back and forth for an hour. And he said, oh, I don't think it's going to be chat. I said, Lex, look at the knowledge exchange that we of just course. had for an yeah. hour, you know, via text. That doesn't occur in a search exchange. And so, again, I, I, I stipulate Google has all the primitives. I just think it's going from a monopolist with monopoly power to something that's going to have to compete with all these others that also have primitives that are going to be very good. And, and this, Either way, the, the consumer The interesting wins. thing about the chat uh, is reinforcement learning. 
which is very underappreciated right now because it's not implemented in most AI experiences. Most AI experiences don't take into account, you know, like if you're on YouTube, you don't tell YouTube like, I'm not interested in that video. There is a way to do it. You hit the yes. three buttons, you say I'm not yeah. interested. Yeah. Nobody does it. What you, what's happening now is you'll be like, hey, play me a song I like, and then you're like, I, I don't like that song, and it'll be like, okay, and it's gonna learn something. And just like when it gives you your restaurant reviews, oh, these are the three Michelin star ones. French, no thank you. Can I get some Japanese in there? And then it's like, okay, next time it's gonna start with Japanese, which you do see in Yelp now, or if you open um, uh, Uber Eats, it's starting to know what you like yeah. very memory. slowly. Memory. And it's, yeah, and, and that dialogue is reinforcement learning, One of being the, completely underappreciated uh -huh. right now. And that's what, anybody here use autopilot on a Tesla? Raise your hand if you use autopilot. Okay, there's like maybe 20 people in the room. Now when you disengage your autopilot, you disengage it because you want to drive yourself, or it gets disengaged because something happened, you were not paying attention. It asks you what just happened, and then you hold the steering wheel volume button and you say what happened. That goes to somebody who then watches the video of you and there's like some line wasn't painted properly and it didn't go in the right lane because that's what happened to me and I keep explaining to it, hey, this lane is not painted properly and then it all of a sudden a week later knows that edge case and fixes that edge case. I, I saw somebody ask a question here that I thought was an interesting one. Yeah, can one. we get the questions to, back? To, I just to, want to, one to, question to, more. To this point, somebody said, you know, is the government going to prevent use of AI in order to protect jobs? Um, you know, we've had a bunch of conversations most recently is last week with, you know, like Congressman Jay Obernolte that's overseeing the House policy on AI regulation. It's very clear that the U.S. has good balance. Like the great power struggle in the world, right, is not going to be fought with, you know, uh, aircraft carriers anymore. It's really on the field of AI. Um, we're not going to, you know, ankle AI in this country. And what we say, and what I've heard Jason say, and I totally agree with it, everybody in this room, you know, all my analysts are using Claude every single day, more than they use Google, to turn themselves into two or three X analysts. Mm. Like, I remember when Google came out, but some people are like, oh, I'm not gonna use that. You know, like, I'm, I'm, I, I have my way of doing it. This tool is going to be super empowered and the people who become, you know, uh, very knowledgeable about it, whether they are designers and media, right, it's gonna displace a lot of designers who resist it. And the designers that embrace it and figure out how to help people do it, right, um, will, will be the winners. So I think and you also have more experiences. So, you know, for every job that will go away in customer service, that's a person who can teach people how to kite board or take them on a tour totally. um, or cook them a meal. And so humans are very clever. They, everybody keeps saying, like, this industrial thing that occurs is going to kill a bunch of jobs. It will retire jobs, but it won't kill human productivity or the desire to be useful in the world. Airbnb is the perfect example. There are a large number of people whose job it is to host Airbnbs because, and did we see all the hotels go away because of Airbnb? No, we saw people take more days off, more travel off, take longer vacations, take vacations to places where maybe they couldn't afford it, or new hubs become new destinations, right? Um, and so, you know, for the travel company I would invest in, it's Uber and Airbnb because all Besides of those- Besides Kift, obviously. Well, I, I've already done that, so it was, I, was, I assume this meant a new one, but yeah, sure. I'd put I mean, I would say one of, you know, there's a question, name one travel company you invest in today. I think you have to redefine what we think of as travel. Like sleeper companies, the sleeper companies in e-commerce, and I would argue experiences, are Instagram and TikTok. Like they are generating massive demand in the world today, yeah. but they're doing it in a very long tail. I mean, you mentioned Mr. Beast, right? This a solopreneur that literally has built a couple hundred million dollar empire. A couple of hundred million I heard in the pot and I right, just. Right, right. Yeah. Around, uh, you know, around a personality, around experiences, et cetera. But it is in every category. There's travel category, beauty category. That's a good question by Edward. Please address how smaller firms across verticals with no data science teams will be able to take advantage of data and AI. Um, the tools are going to allow you to do that. There is um, a data interpreter in ChatGPT4 if you play for it. And uh, you can just upload any CSV file, any data file that's floating around your organization and say, tell me about this. And it all of a sudden just starts telling you about it. And then you ask it a follow-up question. What trends do you see in the data? And so it's going to start figuring out just random stuff for you. The concept of a data scientist being a distinct job in the world would be like saying that you have a typing pool in your company. Remember typing pool? Anybody here remember the typing pool? Anybody remember the mail room? 
<laughs> Anybody go to an office? <laughs> there was a photocopy room. It was, it's where they make copies of the paper. Well, uh, that's paper, what I did for you for a long time. Well, yeah, and you, like literally there was somebody who, but typing was like a pool. You know, the New York Times reporters used to drop off their stories on legal pads to be typed. Lawyers used to go down to the typing pool. That's the data scientist equivalent. You're all gonna be data scientists. We are all gonna be able to talk to this AI assistant and say, tell me which you know, neighborhoods um, are gonna be the next places where people want to put Airbnbs, or which neighborhoods you know, in Tokyo don't have Airbnbs but should. And it's gonna be like, well, okay, there's a couple of great restaurants here in a great park, but there's not a lot of um, Airbnbs. It would seem like a good place to put one. It's right above a cafe. In fact, I think this building would be the best building. Mm. <laughs> it's going to be that smart. Let, let, me, let me make two plugs for my good friend, Jay Cal. Oh, here we I go. I like to bust his chops a lot. Um, Mondays on This Week in Startups, great AI episodes where they actually try a bunch of products. Yeah, that's a great And one. they actually it's becoming popular, watch yeah. it and see the trial. Second is, Jason, like he said, takes 20,000 applications a year, invests in 150 companies a year, like puts on founder universities. So if, if you, you have an idea and you're building it, yeah. Jason at Calicanus.com. So the long com. tail <laughs> for travel, life. startups, like, ought to be talking to law. We're, we're seeing a lot of people who want to build stuff uh, in travel. In travel. And uh, it, it almost universally has something to do with the itinerary or the experience on the ground. And so yeah, I think sense. people are working backwards from what is the feeling not the place. Yeah. What is the feeling, not the place? I want to feel culture. I want to, in, in Brad's case, dress up and you know, dance until four sunrise, you know, <laughs> and to tribal dance music. Uh, Burning Man reference. Burning Man reference, like he's gonna wanna do that. Um, this, not, not this year. Not this year? I went this year, yes I did. Year? It was a With great mud. year. Yeah, you got out, yeah, speaking of travel. Did you have to get um, extracted no. out no, of there? Burning Man is the perfect example of experiential. Yeah. Like people Very want true. to feel something and they're gonna have more time to feel something. I think your travel is the greatest vertical to be in right now. Okay. You just have to be super creative and think about the feeling that people are trying to have and work backwards from the feeling and most importantly, the Instagram photo. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay, That's travel the is the greatest vertical to be in. Let's end here because Brian is going to kick me out. Uh, we're over time. Thank you very much for, Thank for, you for being having here. Us. Thank you, folks. Give it up for Rafat. I mean, amazing.